You're saying uh, Portugal people are actually victims of their government. We are. I mean, because um, since '74 that we have a, a running democracy, uh, we had the republic. You know, the kings first, and the republic. And then we had the, like a right wing dictatorship. Then in '74, um, the army liberated the people, and uh, from that moment on, even though there was a lot of prosperity, and Portugal cannot be compared. As a country, uh, to 40 years or 50 years ago, nowadays you know we're just electing people interested in lobbying and not in um, ruling for the, you know, for the for the voters, and that's a very big problem uh, in Europe. Uh, not to blame it all in the politicians, but um, we have very very bad politicians in, around Europe doing uh, really wrong things and going away. We shouldn't go because it's a dangerous way. Do you see uh, uh, any parallels in, uh, do you pay attention to American politics at all? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Do you see, is it the same thing here that you, that you see that you see over there? Well, you know, in Europe they kind of use the um, U.S. Um, crisis uh, as an excuse for our own crisis, even though it had an impact. Um, I believe that Europe had it coming as well and the, only because you know um, there's a certain form of capitalism that, that doesn't work in Europe. We follow very closely you know American um, politics and special finances because we were like you know also trying to learn from what was done bad here you know by the banks and by the the corrupted people in, um, in Wall Street and I've seen a lot of the commentaries like inside job and read some books written from right. Jekyll Island it's, it's nice to be informed because, uh, you know, even though I wasn't buying into a lot of conspiracy theories before, uh, the fact is that there are many people, um, you know, in not only the U.S., but in the European administration and, and governors that have worked for the banks that were, you know, responsible for this financial crisis, and they're still deciding, you know, the economy of countries, and that's really mind-blowing, you know, and it's really something that um, we have to do something about it, you know. They should be in jail. They should be in jail, yeah. I mean, in Portugal there was one big bank scandal. Um, we, um, the government, I mean the taxpayers had to bail out the bank and they cost us more money than all our external debt. You know, um, how many people went to jail? One. And he's um, in the kind of um, house prison, so he's not in the jail. <laughs> he's not in a cell with Bubba. No, definitely not. Should be. <laughs> yeah, but he isn't. Yeah, it's too bad. Now, uh, I hear that over in Portugal, you guys eat a lot of fish. Is that true? Yes, exactly true. Yeah. And it's true that cod is the main fish of consumption over there? Yeah, it's, it's strange, but um, because we have um, a very big coastline, uh, like most of Portugal is coastline, and um, we have a lot, all kinds of fish there. We do not have cod. We can, uh, We have to import them from Norway. So we are number one uh, in the cod, uh, like import. But it's a very national um, tradition. It stands for um, you know really really important um, family meal. Uh, people have it for Christmas. People have it everywhere, every time. And um, we, it's not like the fresh cod. We kind of salt it first, and it stays for a while. That's the way it's um, right. conserved. And then, I mean, my grandma says there's um, 365 days in the year, 365 ways of cooking cod. Nice. And I believe her. Yeah, I've seen a lot. <laughs> and when you are at home, do you cook? I love to cook, yeah. My wife, she doesn't like so much to cook. It's true, but, um, you know, I really like because, um, you know, I'm always six months on the road, six months at home. So after, you know, parting out and after doing everything um, that a guy does, uh, does on the road, I'm now 38, I have a kid, I have a wife. Even though I like to have fun, when I'm um, at home, I like to be exactly the opposite. Like I still work with Moonspell, I still work, you know, rehearsing and, and composing and doing all, all of that. But I like the domestic thing a lot, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, Mike, our drummer, is almost a, a chef. He cooks really well. Wow. But I do, I do my stuff. I do a, a cool um, codfish plate yeah, as well. Oh, nice. Dish, yeah. 
Well, maybe one day when I'm in yeah. Portugal, I'll stop by. Yeah, definitely, man. Now, 92 is when you guys got together? 92, exactly, yeah. And you have nine full-length CDs, is that correct? Nine full-length, yeah. And uh, your most recent one, is it a double or is it a bonus is the double? Well, it's a good question, you know, because um, creatively we did uh, Alpha Noir Omega White um, as one album, one musical experience, two different sides of, um, of a band. But Alpha Noir got um, like an edition, uh, but the special edition that they did that comes on a special digipack and all that contains the, the two albums. So for the band, it's no bonus. It's as important as uh, Alpha Noir, but, um, you know, Alpha Noir kind of became the main album because that's what people had access for reviews, etc. But creatively, I think the albums uh, stand together. And, and nowadays, it's, you know, it's easy to get hold of, of both. So, I mean, if the fan wants to have the musical experience, both albums are definitely a good way of picturing what we wanted with, uh, with this double, double release. And most, most bands will do something extra for the Japanese. Have you done anything extra for the Japanese on this release? Um, I don't think so. That depends on the labels. We always did like, um, they always pick up extra songs from, not only for the Japanese uh, market. Uh, our old label Century Media used to do it for the North American market um, as well. And you know, there's always strange, even though we are in the industry as well for more than 20 years, there's always these strange things that we don't understand, why the album comes always later in the US and not at the same time in Europe. But there's always um, an explanation um, for that. But um, I believe, you, I mean, um, nowadays um, the labels just have, you know, the same releases everywhere. Sometimes they make uh, like a special song for iTunes. Things have changed a lot, you know, and um, for the Japanese market, I, th I don't know what's available there really, but it should be like, um, this uh, album had already a lot of ed editions on vinyl and double vinyl and double CD and, you know, you name it. So <laughs> there's plenty of stuff available. Nowadays they have to hurry up and release it because it'll get released by itself, right? Well, I mean, we were formed in the 90s, so we kind of grew along with labels, you know. Um, all these uh, releases yourself, it's quite, um, not recent, you know, but... Um, what I meant was it'll get, it'll get uploaded to the uh, oh, internet by itself. Yeah, that, that's, something, that's something, I mean, we have to care, but there's no, no, no other option than to um, creep on uh, being creative, you know, to do a special edition that the fans find their um, word for their money as well and to do more um, interesting music and to come up with something that people really want to buy. I don't think we can uh, really fight it and I'm not the guy that's fighting against the labels. I mean, um, some once we needed them, nowadays it's a bit different. But I'm not the kind of angry guy, you know, that goes out in an expensive dinner with a label and then comes home and bitches about them um, on a blog or in, on the internet. I like to co collaborate with people. This is also a business. This is also working for a lot of us. So I personally believe in um, collaboration while maintaining Moonspell more, the more independent uh, possible. We did all the recordings for the album and we had the finished product all. Um, and um, almost, and only then we, we started looking for labels. You know, we were financing everything from our own pocket because we didn't want, you know, to get stopped waiting on a on a label to sign us. You are uh, you're currently on Napalm Records, right? Yeah, Napalm Records. Yeah. That's uh, how's that working out for you in from label to label? Well, um, we've been in a couple of labels before, and Napalm Records is an upcoming label, so. It's got, even though they have history, they um, were more, um, you know, uh, releasing underground black metal and they wanted to expand a little bit on their sound. So they started signing different bands and bands already with some history like Moonspell or Tiamat. And it's working um, great. I mean, we're just uh, giving our first steps here um, in the States. You know, so um, we need to see more of the work now that we are here. But in, in Europe, they did a, also a, a, a great job, and we had lots of uh, exposure and interviews. The reviews were really good here in North America. So I'm, I'm happy. You know, it's like working um, with um, younger people again uh, that that are not so affected, you know, by the vices of being in a label for too long and flirting there with the multinational. They have a very close relationship with the fans as well and I, I kind of like that as a musician. Do you write specifically for an album? Like do you like, okay, 
it's June. We're gonna write for the next album, or do you just write over, over whatever, over whatever period of time? We're always writing. I don't believe that, um, you know, um, obviously an album has to have a constant, has to have one direction, but um, in, in a way, if you keep on writing, it's easier to find that direction, you know. So we don't take time to um, um, write one album. Obviously, when we have a couple of songs together that we think have a constant, have a storyline that can go into an album, then we take the time that is needed, you know, to record it, to produce it, um, to deal with all the different aspects um, of, um, of the album. But um, I see Moonspell as something always flowing, really, you know. I don't see it as a studio time, lifetime, because even when we are on studio, we always have weekends that we play live or festivals um, going on. So basically, we never take the time off to, uh, to write an album, we just keep on, on writing until we find something that we find powerful enough, you know, to build a, an album upon. So you're working with uh, two Madsen again, this is the second time. Yeah, yeah. We worked with um, a lot of producers and uh, he did um, already, it's the third time he works for us because he did a re-recording called Anna oh, Satanai, okay, right. which was a re-recording of our old stuff. Then he did Night Eternal, and we really liked that sound. And um, and then we decided to use him um, again. Even though we work with several people, we also work with a German guy called Benny Richter for the songwriting, a young guy from a different generation, classical trained musician. <coughs> Sorry, but um, yeah, Two Matson was um, was doing the album and doing the um, the mixing, and we are super happy because you know he knows us inside out. He was in Portugal a couple of times to set up our own studio because we did all the tracking back home, vocals, only Mike, the, the drummer, went to um, Denmark to um, to record his, um, his drums for both albums. So it was a quite easy going, long process, but um, it's always lovely, you know, to work with two Mats and he's a good friend, he already visited us a couple of times in Portugal for the shows, he was in the release show in Lisbon. Yeah, it's great, yeah. It's great. great, great sound, great sound for sure. Yeah, definitely, I love his sound, yeah. So now you're on tour in America with Marduk, Inquisition, Death Wolf, and uh, is it the Foreshadow? Foreshadowing, okay. yeah. That's somewhat of an eclectic bill. Yeah, it is. I mean, um, in Europe, um, it's quite um, you know normal, regular that um, eclectic bills show up. You know, all these uh, package festival tours, something that it's going on for quite a long in Europe. So rock um, the nation our agent in the in the US decided why not trying out something I mean there were some voices that said it's too eclectic and fans will hate each other but that's not what we see every night you know there's um, actually room for every sensibility you know there's room for every kind of metal Munzberg is a very different metal band than Marduk or Inquisition that um, are more um, towards black metal, but it clicks well with the foreshadowing, for instance, which are more melodic. And I think people are really appreciating the difference. At least in our case, it's making a, a positive effect in people and not not otherwise. So I think these definitely eclectic bills are definitely a win, definitely. Excellent. And what's uh, next for Moonspell after this tour with uh, Marduk? Guess what? More touring. Um, oh, imagine that. Yeah. Uh, this will be uh, last year when we released Alpha Noir, Omega White was already very busy. So um, after the, um, this tour with Marduk, we are going to um, do immediately a festival, Inferno Festival, um, in Norway with um, Satyricon and D-Side. It's a good, good um, festival that kind of is also a warm-up for all the summer festival season that we are going to do up to August, Hellfest, Summer Breeze, Grass Pop many of the important festivals um, in Europe and we also have a European tour headliner tour coming out with a um, Finnish band supporting called Insomnium and um, this is going to be in April so up to August we are you know in and out of Portugal playing um, playing everywhere and um, already thinking probably a, a, um, a possible return to to the US um, maybe before the, the the end of this year you know just to play some more cities and get some new fans Cool. All right, well, thank you for your time. No problem.